beers with us today to explore how um, creators aiming to aim to go viral viral by following algorithms um, and in the process make content make cringe content. Uh, Professor Mears completed her PhD from New York University in 2009. She's now a professor of sociology at Boston University. Before her PhD, she worked as a fashion model. Her PhD research was on the culture and economics of the modeling industry. Much of this was at least partially covert research that she conducted while modeling in New York during her PhD. Um, so she published this in 2011 in a book titled Pricing Beauty, the Making of a Fashion Model. I first learned about Ashley's work when reported on some ethnographic research on women recruited by promoters um, to attend elite global VIP parties. She analyzed the VIP party circuit as a, quote, complex world of exchange and exploitation, unquote, in which club owners, promoters, and attractive women negotiate relationships and status in a social world of, quote, gendered and racialized hierarchies, unquote. This work was published in her 2000 very important people, status and beauty in the global party circuit. So Ashley is here today to talk about her current research on uh, platform economy uh, and online creators. So this presentation is going to run from about uh, 35 to 40 minutes, followed by a question and answer afterward. Um, if you're joining us online, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, those in your room, save your questions till the end. Um, for your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on the OII website shortly. So it's great to have you. Look Thank you. Hearing Thank you. It's really great to be in communication with uh, people at the Internet Institute. It's a relatively new field for me. Um, and I'll have to give you a little warning. So I'm an ethnographer, which means that I work pretty inductively. I'm going to share a lot of data. I don't have the theoretical story completely stitched up, but I, I hope that we can kind of work towards those ends in the conversation. So, all right, let's start with um, what is going on here. Um, <laughs> right, well, uh, I'm trying to get your attention. And so is this woman. She's a viral content creator. Um, I spent over the last two years, about 16 months observing and interviewing uh, people like Anna here who make content um, regularly that goes viral on Facebook, also TikTok and Snapchat. And this has been a study in the attention economy. It's a study in how it is content creators understand and monetize and pursue people's attention and profit from it. And um, in thinking about viral content, you know, th there's kind of two, two ways that most people might think about it, that virality on the one hand might appear as something just spontaneous, right? When something goes viral, it means it's being viewed and it's being shared widely across platforms. Sometimes it jumps off of platforms into traditional news media, uh, making the news like um, you saw this professor who got Zoom bombed by his own children. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're my generation, you would remember the Star Wars kid, um, one of the kind of early instances of virality, right? Like maybe there's an intrinsically interesting about content that kind of organically uh, people share. <clears throat> On the other hand, some people might think that virality is an instance of propaganda, that it might be um, something that states, uh, governments, and corporations are engineering from the top down. A third way um, that, that has been the bulk of my fascination, which is that virality is also a cultural production. It's okay, we're back. We're back. The internet's back. Um, okay, so I was, I was telling you a little bit about the sample of people that I interviewed. So I interviewed 60 content creators that worked with this company and also that had worked with, that worked with competitor companies. Um, so they're white, they're between, mostly they're between the ages of 25 and 30. Um, and one of the more interesting things about them is that there's a disproportionate share of entertainers, especially performing artists, so um, singers, filmmakers, comedians, and magicians. Um, the founder of the company is himself a magician. Uh, magicians are very well connected with each other. There's quite a community of magicians. Um, and magicians are also really skilled at manipulating attention, right? Look over here while I do the trick over there, which is essentially what a viral video does. It's the manipulation of attention. Okay, so um, this in-person ethnography took me into interesting places, right? Like filming at Walmart uh, together. 
Um, uh, then eventually they also gave me my own Facebook page that was monetized so that I could learn by doing and immerse myself into cultural production firsthand. So I scripted my own content. Um, I hired an undergrad filmmaker to, uh, to help me at one point. Um, I hired actors. Um, I acted in my own videos. I edited them. I learned how to study the data. I made engagement bait photos. If you're familiar with Patricia Lockwood's really excellent novel, no one is talking about this, you'll get the joke, can a dog be twins? But this highbrow literary reference doesn't get nearly as much uh, uh, reaction as what do you put on your hot dogs? <laughs> yeah. so you can kind of see where this is going. Um, so it, this culminated in me um, uh, scripting, directing, and starring in my own banger that got 180 million views. It was the number three most watched video on the Facebook platform in January of 2021, and it grossed $84,000. Um, I didn't get to keep all of that money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I learned through all of this were these surprising ways that creative workers are interpreting data and working with algorithms. And that's going to be the kind of focus of my, my uh, talk. So when I say an algorithm, I'm referring to the step-by-step -step code for computers to act on data. In the Facebook world, there's two types of algorithms that content creators are attuned to. Um, the first are the recommender algorithms that can promote content, right? So nobody's seeing you until some combination of watches and shares and engagement um, and interest by the platform uh, will make it boost and kind of take off. So they're interested in, in uh, catching the recommendations while avoiding the penalties of content moderation algorithms, which ensure that the content stays within the community standards. All platforms have some kind of community standards, uh, which are Facebook's um, uh, prohibitions against um, what essentially is public speech under their private rules of what they think should be, you know, not objectionable content or uh, not inauthentic or not criminal, uh, for instance. Um, so, uh, yeah, the content creators are working with algorithms because they both incentivize but also can uh, discipline them. And if you get flagged with a violation of the community standards, the penalties can range from demonetization of a particular video to actually having your page uh, be suspended or, and being uh, kicked off the platform and, and many other gradations of penalties. So um, yeah, this led me uh, uh, leads me into a question around how do content creators work with algorithms and how do these platform metrics and algorithms shape creative choices and sensibilities around what's good cultural production? I'm, I'm gonna argue that um, through working with algorithms, content creators come to adapt a different type of evaluative repertoire uh, that's defined by metrics, such the creators, many of whom uh, were, uh, were performers before, like Alex here, who is a live streamer, um, end up making content that they themselves describe as, quote, so cringe. And this is a video of Alex eating a condom out of a cupcake, which was a set up fake prank that got uh, about 700 and million views and made them a lot of money. Um, yeah, so that's a, a bit of a puzzle, right? Like, how do artists end up making cringe content? And cringe is that uh, a, a term in which it describes something that feels so bad that it's personally embarrassing to watch. Um, and many, many of these creative workers, again, because they have arts backgrounds, they prize an artistic sensibility and they have a notion of good taste that they end up making um, kind of contradictory uh, creative decisions. So my answer, just to preview my argument here, um, is a, a theory of the performativity of algorithms through a labor process. I argue that you can't really understand this puzzling outcome without diving into and understanding the labor and how content creators confront and work with uh, metrics and algorithms. So I'll map this out in these steps as datification, these are very complicated words, but it'll be simple when I show it. So datification, alienation, simplification, replication, gamification, and then finally fusion. And through this process, through going through these steps, uh, content creators, I argue, um, end up kind of reproducing algorithmic values first by anticipating what the Facebook algorithm wants and doesn't want, and then reproducing that in the form of their creative decisions, often against their own personal sense of taste. Okay, so that's the argument. Um, you know, to put it another way, we could say that the metrics don't just capture the market, the metrics actually make the market, right? But through this labor process, it's a labor process story. Okay, so first, step one is datafication. 
Datification just refers to this new ability because of technologies uh, to render into data different aspects of our lives that previously weren't seen. Yeah, they're making visible all kinds of things that uh, previously artists just could only guess at. So content creators confront data in the Facebook Creator Studio. When I log in, I get access to all of these data points that are color coded in really enticing ways. Yeah, when I log in, I can see uh, how well I'm performing, my performance metrics, how many views I'm doing. Um, how many minutes and the average minutes I can see if I'm going up relative to my performance last week, or as is often the case, I'm going down. And, there, and those arrows are in red, <laughs> like makes you feel a little bit of an alarm. Um, I can see also uh, how I, yeah, okay, so here we're doing well, here we're doing badly. Um, I can see how I'm doing relative to my past videos. I can see how I'm doing compared to pages similar to mine. Um, I can see even within a single video at what point people are watching right? Like when people are, are um, they're more attuned to it and when they start dropping off. And yeah? so I can see at the second and I can actually move my cursor over here and see what's happening in the video at that moment where I'm losing people and when I'm gaining people. And so this kind of this rendering of, of all kinds of uh, new things to see. Yeah. Go here. Um, so content creators, when I interview them, they explain that when they're interacting with all of this data, it allows them to approach the content in a very different way. They're not relying on gut feelings, right, as they would in their previous careers as artists, but rather, as one said, what we do for these silly little videos is very scientific. We don't just post random videos, we're following a formula, or it's very mathematical. Okay, so this is datification. Step two, onto alienation. So alienation just refers to that separation or estrangement of oneself into another realm, right? In Marx's definition, that would be into the market. Um, and here we can see alienation unfolding in a couple of different ways. The first is most basically alienation from one's own taste. So people refer to their own content with these devalued terms like silly, cringe, mindless, shittainment <laughs> in one example. Um, Will, who's a filmmaker, uh, explained, you know, if people wanted the avant-garde, we'd give it to them, but they want dumbass shit, right? So they're talking about their own content uh, in these relatively devalued ways as something that's different and estranged from their own taste, yeah? Um, notice also the devaluation implied here of the audience as well, right? Like this is the audience's taste, it's not my, my personal taste. There's also alienation that I observe from the body, uh, particularly women's body. So women come into this and they understand in a fairly short amount of time that objectification of the body is one way to hook attention, right? If you're trying to capture somebody's attention, um, uh, BBLM was at, at one point um, a shorthand for a way to do it, which would be breast, butts, legs, and mouth typically of women. Um, so you end up seeing uh, uh, opening shots of videos or kind of moments in videos in which women's bodies in various states of undress or potential undress uh, are being used. And this comes out in the way content creators also talk. Um, I mean, I could see it when I was filming with them, but also, you know, they kind of talk about like, this is, this, this is just what's going to work. But when we're filming together, they're actually, the way that they even hold the camera is kind of structured in anticipation that this is what's going to hook attention, right? So filming this shot, uh, again, Will, Will the filmmaker says, yeah, I think this is gonna work, right? Like face, ass, face, ass, people are gonna watch that. You know, so he has a kind of intuitive sense already um, that, that ends up structuring even the way that he'll, he'll hold the phone in his own uh, gaze through the camera phone. You should also notice that the limits on objectification of the body are again set by the platform itself with those community standards. Um, and so this is a, a, a graph that came out from Facebook's own, um, uh, the, 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 uh, it was their own report that they offered to content creators um, suggesting that indeed what's, what's allowed uh, and what's uh, prohibited, this kind of line here, usually does attract more engagement, yeah? And so this is kind of colloquially referred to as like the edge lord, right? Like there's an incentive that people feel to push as close as they can to the edge without actually showing nudity, right? To look like violence might happen without actually showing violence. But that engagement, that kind of attention increases the closer you get to that, uh, to that edge, yeah? Um, and this results in all kinds of um, 
uh, attention games, as, as I call it, with one of my uh, co-authors, um, a kind of cat and mouse. So content creators will get as close as they can. And then if the platform uh, puts a flag, like a demonetization penalty, then they'll back off and they share information with each other about how close can they get to that edge, right? And so for instance, um, uh, on set with Addie and Elsa, they're you know showing to have the camera kind of looking up her skirt, but don't show, don't actually show up her skirt. Yeah, like come close as you can. So that's the, the these are the limits of objectification of the body and alienation from the body determined by the platform. Yeah, set by the platform, policed by algorithms. There's also alienation from the audience, and this is a very different story from what you may have have uh, read about in literature on influencers, which suggests that influencers really do pay attention to what their fans and their audiences want, and they invest in what Nancy Bain calls relational work to cultivate relationships with their audiences. The viral content creator doesn't work like that. Viral content creators, um, especially something that's going viral, it's getting thousands of comments. Yeah, and because the worst comments, the comments that have the most outrage are the ones that rise to the top. Those are the ones that are most visible or critical comments. Viral content creators understand a mark of success is actually getting critical comments. As one content creator told me, you're not doing it right until the mean comments come in, right? Um, uh, if, you know, for example, right? Like you can get awesome, I loved it, or you can get is this stupid, right? Well, you, you can read them. Um, but one, uh, one former performer, a very successful viral content creator explains that it turns out that my dignity online has a price and the price of my dignity is $80,000. And I'm 100% good with that price. <laughs> yeah. So this is like a, a very basic example of, uh, of alienation. Um, as a side note, you know, alienation leads to uh, inauthentic content. Again, this is in contrast to what a lot of the literature on influencers and other content creators would suggest, the primacy of uh, showing the authentic self in social media. That's not the case for viral content creators. They're showing situational authenticity. A viral content creator wants to show something that looks like it could be a plausible situation that you would see in your newsfeed from friends and family. So like a birthday party gone wrong or like, you know, cheating boyfriend gets caught. These are situations of everyday life that look like regular user generated content, right? Like the cleaning lady gets this massive apartment, right? So they use normal people, but these are fake videos, but situations that should look, you know, quite normal. So there's low production value deliberately. Yeah, like by design. She's actually a hive actress, by the way. And that's a that's a rented Airbnb apartment. Um, right. And so this is really different than if you if you look at some of the work on influencers like Angel Kristen who finds that people are, are showing their personal authenticity, their personal taste, right? The, the food that they're actually eating and they have to demonstrate their real self or their real passions, for instance, in uh, vegan influencers. Okay, so that's alienation. I'll walk us through simplification uh, fairly quickly. So simplification simply is oh, what happens when metrics simplify a, a complicated value landscape, right? Like there's there's many there's many different stories that you could show as an entertainer or as an artist, but when you're showing it with the aim to go viral, you simplify people into flat stereotypes, right? You simplify women into bodies. And in this instance, you can simplify uh, race into racialized stereotypes. So for instance, uh, talking with a content creator, uh, Gil, uh, who's working with a, one of the few Black content creators uh, in the company, Henry, uh, Gil explains that we lean heavily into all the stereotypes, right? They've been halfway through a video where there's a criminal and a cop, and then Henry walks out, and uh, here's Henry, and he'll say, why is the cop Black and the criminal White? Swap the characters, right? So they lean into these stereotypes because that's what people will recognize the most kind of simplification of complex human stories. Uh, and so they use race this way, they'll, they'll use gender this way, they use Karens in this way, Karen, a kind of stereotypical homogeny white woman, entitled white woman, uh, and so on. So stories get simplified and then they get replicated. So replication like my term just for copying. Yeah, you know, when something goes viral, even within the company that I studied, if something takes off, they're posting internally on their group and they're pointing out this is working. So next, there's going to be 30 of the same the next day. Yeah. People copy immediately, even even you know, within the within the hour, people will be, do, will be copying. So for instance, you'll end up with a you know sexualized imagery of a woman making a plaster cast of her hand around a banana, right? This has obviously window. And then it just kind of ricochets. Yeah, and now a woman does it with her oily feet with an eggplant. And now a mom and uh, daughter 
do it with a rose, you know, trying out kind of different variations. And you see this sort of um, how memes work, right? In this relatively short amount of period, um, people are calling each other a company as well. This is internal in the company that I studied. The company is seeing other people's content. They're kind of all in each other. Uh, as addition told me, do we replicate? Um, do people replicate, copy, and mimic 100%? We copy them, they copy us, right? If you're trying to, you copy what works. So there's no um, kind of artistic integrity on a particular genre. It's rather just following whatever is working in the ecosystem. Replication, um, uh, for example, takes this form in which uh, somebody even found uh, on LinkedIn, a job advertisement for a competitor company that's recruiting people to make content like these other, con so they're saying like, what we aim to do is inspired by all of these other content creators. And that's actually in the formal job ad that they're posting on LinkedIn when they're trying to recruit people. And this is a, a competitor company that's operating out, out of uh, Cyprus. Okay, so replication is sort of built into uh, by design even when they're setting up. So I have a side note here, um, which I, I'm very curious to know your thoughts about, um, because I, you know, one outcome of this is fake news in an unexpected way. Um, and so fake news, we often think of this as politicized disinformation, but often their content, because to replicate ordinary user-generated uh, scenes of everyday life, also can reporters who will post and report about it on um, uh, traditional or legacy media, like on the uh, like on the news. So you know, the New York Post reports that there's this unruly behavior on an airplane. Those are content creators, right? That's a wig. They planned that out for like many many weeks, right? Um, and even when they when they put a disclaimer on their page that this is entertainment purposes, because there's so much theft in the social media economy that things will get just ripped and re-uploaded on uh, TikTok, and then it'll appear on Reddit, it'll appear on Twitter. So the origins are very hard to trace. Yeah, the context is uh, kind of immediately uprooted, and it happens very quickly. So it's very hard to kind of trace. So uh, it'll make the morning news, uh, like the Today Show, that uh, you know our actress here was gifted an apartment. Yeah, um, so I think there's something very interesting here to kind of trace um, trace how this becomes fake news and, and to try to adjudicate the differences um, among varieties of inauthenticity online. But that's just a side note. So coming coming back to the main story on the labor process, our next step is gamification. Um, so gamification. Uh, happens. Um, it happens when a, an activity becomes redefined as fun and as a game, uh, and arguably this is very much by design by the platform to encourage and incentivize commitment from content creators to keep making more content. It happens in a, in a lot of different ways for a Facebook content creator. Uh, one kind of obvious one is that when something starts to go viral, it feels really good. It feels really thrilling. And the Facebook Creator Studio helps the content creator feel good about it by giving metrics that are exciting. So up here in the upper left corner, you can see the number of people that are watching it live. When a video is going viral, you can see like, you know, 126,000 people watching you at the moment. And almost every content creator that I talk to, when they've had this experience, they talk about that number as being really, really exciting. Um, so Alex says that it's like, um, it's like a stadium, right? Like how many views does a Super Bowl get? Or like, they'll talk about like a Taylor Swift concert is looking at my face right now. And then every three minutes, there's a new, there's a new batch of people. People. And then the number is going up and then sometimes it's going down and people will use explicit references to addiction, dopamine and drugs when they're talking about this experience. So, for instance, one magician named Tom says it's a dopamine addiction. When you watch the live viewers go from 4,000, 8,000, 10,000, 20,000 and you go, oh, it's going back down Then boom, 32,000. Right. There's no other word for it. That's why people do so well. I was interviewing him and his partner. Uh, while they had a video that was going off and they actually hadn't slept very much the night before because they kept waking up to check their phones and they were like laughing kind of maniacally during the interview, you know, like checking the number and telling me how viral they were going. Yeah. Um, so many people uh, talk in these kind of parallels uh, to casinos, for instance, um, as Rick would say, 
it's like a casino uh, when he checks on the creator studio because the numbers don't always go up. You don't know if they're going to go up or down. And every set of bad numbers is a new problem uh, to solve. So how do I get the numbers to go from red to green? And it's compelling like a game. Very clear parallels uh, to the work of Natasha Schull um, on, uh, on casinos. Okay, and then finally, through this labor process, at the end of it, the content creators, um, contrary to a, a sort of critical or Marxist analysis of alienated labor, they don't feel alienated. They feel really empowered. Most of the content creators that I interviewed talked about the work that they do, uh, making viral videos as being extremely fulfilling. Um, and I argue that this reflects a certain kind of fusion or a transformation of how they evaluate quality, rather from quality of, of creative choices to quantity, right, as defined by metrics. So a magician says, I've gone from thinking that we're making shitty videos to going, now we're making great entertainment and people love it. That's disturbing for the elites um, and people who like high art because we are creating shit and people love it. <laughs> yeah. So he finds a new validation in uh, in the fact that there's so many people that are watching the content that must mean that it's it's good. So they're redefining uh, quality for content. Okay, so a couple of a couple of ideas to, to wrap up um, and to conclude this um, presentation on labor, right? And what is the what is the logic of making cringe content? Um, you know, first, I think of, of algorithms are are not are cannot be wrong, and I, I mean that in a, a sort of epistemological sense because the algorithms are infallible rules. Like the you know, unlike humans, they don't they don't make mistakes. They kind of do what they're trained to do. Uh, but I also mean it from the point of view of the content creator. Algorithms are actually accurate arbiters, right? Unlike gatekeepers in traditional media industries, and even unlike an audience in a live stage, which feels compelled to clap because other people are clapping, right? It feels compelled to stay and watch you because it's awkward to leave the room when it's boring, right? But it, but the Facebook platform captures attention in its purest sense. And so from their perspective, they're actually doing something that's um, much more accurate to creating good content, but again, good defined in these algorithmic terms, right? So theoretically, we could say from their perspective, algorithms are a camera. They're not an engine, which is contrary to work in economic sociology from people uh, like McKenzie. Um, and yes, so I would just add that creative labor's enact or create creative labor's enact what they expect will be algorithmically valued choices. So they're kind of feeling an algorithm and then feeding an algorithm what they anticipate uh, will be valued. And it, again, it, they're aligning their whole selves physically and emotionally with the platform. Everything that they do is actually really tightly structured by the incentives that are created by the feel that they get from these algorithms. And they really tightly follow this feedback they get from the site and the feedback that they're getting from the site, these data metrics are much more nuanced and elaborate than what, uh, what they've ever experienced before as artists and entertainers. All right, and I would also argue um, that this can lead to subpar outcomes in the form of cringe content, uh, even for people who, who might um, uh, think say that uh, it's not cringe, it's, it's actually good. Um, so I'll, I'll just take a moment to scale up a little bit to a larger theoretical proposal um, from, I've given you this sort of really textured granular story about labor process, um, but you know, how to make sense of this in the creator economy writ large. So I'll tell you a totally different story now um, of, uh, of the answer. Um, and this is from my reading of the literature, but also spending time uh, with a woman that I know is a brand ambassador for uh, Chanel Moscow. And I went with her one day on a photo shoot that she was doing in Brooklyn, um, where she wanted more content for her Instagram, which has, I don't know, 75,000 followers. Chanel sends her the clothes to be photographed in. Uh, she has to then send them back. Yeah. The hotel let her use the room for free. The photographer was doing it for free. Makeup artists. Everybody's doing it for free because they all want the pictures. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really exhausting. We spent four hours taking pictures. I didn't even do anything. I was very tired afterwards. And uh, and I suggest I said, like, shouldn't you get to keep the Chanel outfit? And she said, what would I do with a Chanel outfit? It's actually um, I've already appeared in it in the pictures, right? Like there's no other value that it could add to her. You know, she can only wear it once. So uh, the whole value is kind of contained uh, just in the image, right? And, and just in that kind of influence of, or, or status. Um, 
she did get to keep the five thousand dollar handbag she was pleased um so i asked her uh I, I explained to her about the viral content creator economy and suggested that we could make actually a lot of money making these videos would she want to do it with me she was like absolutely not right <laughs> she's very embarrassed for me uh, that i would even bother because for the influencer in this end of the market the value that she's acquiring here is all in the symbolic realm which is a long-term game that it might be convertible for you know more social ties or more prestigious opportunities it's a, it's a game of a, a, a cultural capital accumulation like she wouldn't want to risk it uh, going into the viral economy so you could think about you know the two of us um the, the influencer and the viral content creator um, in Bourdieu's terms, kind of stratified between economic and symbolic capital, right? And here I'm moving towards a theory of the value of attention online, riffing off of Bourdieu's rules of art. And he identifies that tension uh, between symbolic and e economic capital. You could think of this as the like two by two table, but I just I put it on a plane here, right? And so um, there's the Instagram influencers or other kinds of brand ambassadors who are doing the long game of influence. And then you have the content farms that don't have any influence, right? They, they, they don't have any status uh, symbolically, but they have a lot of economic capital. Yeah, so there's this inverse relation. And, um, and you can see pretty interesting differences that come out that I, I think help us rethink some standard notions in social media studies and creator studies around authenticity and relational work. So um, most of the literature is built on small studies of, of influencers or people who are appealing to a niche audience. They're looking for a long-term conversion strategy, you know, to like sell a cookbook if they're vegan influencers or like launch a fashion line if they're lifestyle influencers. They're building that brand off of personal authenticity, right? That's the, that's the logic of personal branding. They're engaging in relational labor uh, with fans. Nancy Bame's work is based on musicians. The content farms really throw that into sharp relief because they're going for mass audiences. It's a short term conversion strategy. They're not looking to monetize on their brand. They're extremely visible, but relatively unknown. If you, I mean, like their names aren't on here. I made my content under a fake name because I don't want to be associated with this content permanently, right? Um, it's a different kind of authenticity and it's a different kind of relational. Uh, approach to fans. I call it a relational withdrawal event, right? Or it's even antagonistic relationship with fans. And it's a, it's a kind of alienated labor in which there's much more kind of close following of algorithms. Okay. And so that's my, that's my, what I'm moving towards, um, trying to map out this theory of uh, the cultural economy of attention, yeah, to situate attention economy in a, in a cultural economy. Um, and with that, I would invite your critiques, uh, questions, and yeah, thank you for your attention. Marvelous. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks. Uh, open the floor here to questions. Who has some questions for Ashley? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, I was. That was brilliant. I really, really enjoyed Ooh, that. That was so interesting. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, considering that you're so that I feel like following the labor process is a really good way to do it. I was wondering, did you get any more insight into the corporate structure of these companies and how yeah. official they were or how gig working they were and how the people who appear on camera related emotionally, but also contractually and financially to the people who own the, com the company as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, um, it's a, it's an, uh, it's an outlier kind of company for many reasons. It's, it's relatively small. Some multi-channel networks are really huge, um, and they don't offer a lot to the people that they take under their wing. Um, they just take a commission. But the, um, and actually, there's a, there's a, a parallel that I think of with that because, um, those companies can be really exploitative and and extractive. The multi-channel networks and, um. If you think about a gold rush, a lot of people talk about this as a gold, like the gold rush of um, of the platform of the uh, creator economy. But, you know, in, in a gold rush, the old saying is that um, you should sell shovels in a gold rush because the people that consistently make the most money are the people that are offering services to the labor, not the people that are finding gold themselves. Um, I, but in this company, there, there really is a collaborative, um, or at the time that I was studying it, there was more of a um, 
a collaborative kind of helping each other. And there really were sizable investments in, in bringing in new content creators. They had a managerial structure where if I wanted to bring in a new content creator, I would be the manager of that person. I would take, I would get an additional small commission off of them, but I would take them under my wing. Um, people are kind of close to each other uh, physically. A lot of people are living in the same city, um, but they're also close to each other socially. So like people's partners and parents get involved, their siblings get involved in it. <laughs> like it was also the pandemic. So a lot of people were out of work or their jobs became insufferable. So this was, so they also had a, a sense of gratitude, um, especially to the founder of the company. The founder of the company himself is really skilled at going viral. He was doing it kind of as a passion for about the last 10 years. And then when it started to become really profitable, he opened it up. Um, so yeah, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of company for sure than um, the, these other multi-channel networks. And I think a much better one, but it's, you know, it's, it's on smaller scale. I think that your question though, um, I could answer it in a different way, which is about their relationship to Facebook. So um, it's really hard for researchers to get into Facebook, right? But the but this company, I know they have a relationship with a Facebook representative. All top performing content creators get access to a rep who will keep them abreast of changes, help them troubleshoot, help them contest if they feel like a page has been um, demonetized unfairly. And so that's a really different, um, that looks really differently than like, if you just tried to do this on your own, it would be really hard if you didn't have that level of support, including Facebook's own support. Yeah. Um, and sorry, there's a there's a really interesting paper by Kaplan and Gillespie called Tiered Governance about how, the, how it is really stratified. Content creators who are already successful, they get away with more and they get more help from the platform through these different kinds of programs. Their, their case is on YouTube, but Facebook is working the same. Yeah, it kind of amplifies this winner take all system for sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm interested if you explore any like context collapses that your interviews experience. Oh, okay. like, oh yeah. <laughs> having strange identities, but also existing in the world. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good one. So the first image that I showed you of somebody drinking out of the toilet bowl, right? Like that made the rounds on on Reddit. Um you know, photo caption contests, you can't imagine what the captions were. Um, apparently I made the rounds on fetish websites as well. Um, they brush those kinds of things off, but a lot of them um, uh, self-police what kind of content that they'll make because they're afraid of what their friends or family will think of them. Um, so for example, two young women uh, would never make that kind of imagery because they're they're uh, single and they're dating and they and they kind of know that they've had many instances where they go on a date with somebody that they meet on Tinder and like that's one of the first things that the date wants to talk about is like oh, sorry I saw you're making spaghetti o pie um, so yeah there's uh, sometimes that happens nothing nothing too like there's no bad stories that they have there's not really any like terrible stories that they have. Um, for the most part, it, like kind of small things that, that they get like microaggressions from their, um, you know, from their uncle or something, but it's quite all right. <laughs> yeah. There is a question here and then we'll go there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how relevant this is, but when you showed that graph showing like um, the interest that people exhibit in the content and like there's a solid line yeah. where it becomes prohibited. I was yeah. wondering if you had any opinions on how this might be related to, I want to say, right wing grifting and yeah. extremist political content, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And like it's riffed on to such a degree in, in popular culture that, you know, the glass onion in the film there's this guy who used to be a games commentator mm -hmm. and then like the film like makes a huge joke out of him becoming a joe rogan like figure talking about oh, oh, right. feminists uh -huh. and it's very profitable for them do you think that's related yes yeah no absolutely so i i think that that graph is coming out of not just for entertainment content but for all all content creators so that they'll the yeah um the like where the line is, is an interesting question in itself. And other people have done work on that about like, how does Facebook actually make the adjudication between like what's permissible and what's not? And like, what was the origins of their um, community standards? Um, but but yeah, for sure, political content is uh, is in there. I think that there's in um, the more outrageous and the more you know illicit the content is, the more interesting it, it will be. I mean, this is kind of, a, a gravitation of human attention goes to things that are are, are kind of more outrageous. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say about it, oh yeah, um, however, Facebook's own data they released shows that from their estimates, political content actually makes up less than 10% of their pages. 
um, not to trivialize it. That's an important, you know, it's <laughs> important, like, you know, 10 or whatever percentage um, that it is. And the consequences are, are arguably much, you know, much more dire and, uh, and relevant than like, you know, toilet milkshake. <laughs> but, I, but I'm still working on how to figure out, like, you know, how to pull out the, um, the threads about labor from this case to apply to that case. So I would say that this is there's probably something really similar happening for people that are making like that kind of content. And actually, there are interesting things about you know, QAnon itself is is a is a game, right? There's gamification in uh, spreading right right wing conspiracy theories that that people by and large probably know are fake, but they're they're kind of pushing it and pushing it because there's a, a reward intrinsic to playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the things you talked about um, was the stage of fusion, mm -hmm. um, and it was very interesting because that was the last stage you talked about. And you also discussed they had a feeling of empowerment mm -hmm. content and created, but also we've seen um, from your talk uh, this idea that there is a very clear disavowal and like the sort of relational like distance yeah. the audience. So I wonder, like, well, you interviewed sixty content creators. Were there any that seem to be aware of some sort of schism in yeah. okay we don't want to be associated with this at all yeah but i feel so powerful my dignity is worth eighty thousand a year or uh -huh. like, that. like was there that level of um some people just going like realizing maybe the, there's a disconnect or just being like yeah they're in but i don't care i'm happy like yeah 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 no it's interesting the contradiction you know you're helping me think through how gamification can actually be applied um in a much greater sense that than just the pursuit of numbers itself but actually the the pursuit of making like how tacky and, and wild can you go making this content i mean that is a that, that is a kind of sport that one can play in this world for sure um there are some content creators, I'll answer your question in a kind of different direction. There are some content creators that um, won't go in that direction, that they hold fast to their principles and they'll see that, I don't know, like the, you know, the, the sexy cooking video is taking off and they simply won't go in that direction because they believe that it's, um, that it's not worth their artistic skill. Mm -hmm. There are um, a handful of them that hold fast to their principles based on religious reasons. So there's there is some devout um, Christians in my sample, and they simply won't show BBLM imagery, right? They won't do any cheater drama um, because it's against their principles. There's a handful. Uh, and there's oh, one, Yes, there's one person in my sample who really thinks of himself as an artist, and he spends a lot of time making his videos. He's a magician, and he simply will not make any other videos that uh, that don't have a really high level of skill of of magic um, for him. Um, and and he spends he like loses money making his own videos, um, and and the other content creators think that he's very strange. Right? <laughs> this is really weird. <laughs> If I could take yeah. a little, so you mentioned gamification as well, and there's something really interesting you said that was like, oh, you can act, there's something intrinsic to it. And yeah. from, uh, I do the master's degree in education, the digital and social change, and the, a lot of the studies that we see are, well, when it comes to educational platform, like ed tech platforms and initiatives, what you see a lot of the time is that those explicit gamification mechanisms, like, oh yeah, you get points, there's a scoreboard, there's a leaderboard, yeah. actually really externalizes the incentives to be, oh, this is all very extrinsic and instrumental. So when it comes to, oh, actually learning this content, actually taking away and studying it and, you know, putting to use later, that fact is put to the wayside very much more in favor of, hey, we want these results. We want the pretty numbers. We don't really care about what we got to do to get them. Mm -hmm. To be fair, like you have to consider the age group of like the different studies, like these are younger students. And well, these content creators, like you said, are 20 to 35, but um, yeah, I find it really interesting that yeah. you say, so from your ethnographic study, would you say that, oh, a lot of these people, they really exhibit this. There's an intrinsic drive for them, even though there's all these numbers they're aiming for. Yeah. Some intrinsic value they want. Yeah, I, I think so for sure, especially, it, so it, it's variable. I think that if I had a larger sample, um, it could be interesting. I don't know if there would be quantitative data on this, but it would be interesting to compare those outcomes uh, on the basis of what they did before becoming a content creator. So um, so artists, for instance, performing artists, including magicians, they really get a kick off of being on stage. And like that is a, that is itself a kind of high and an addiction that, that I think a lot of people really suffered in the pandemic when the when the stages were closed. Um, and so this was one way of kind of channeling that uh, that performance. But when the stages reopened, 
and they were very happy to uh, to go back and to perform. Um, but yeah, they'll they'll definitely draw on it. So I call it a discourse of uh, of pleasing an audience, right? Like they're they're putting their talents as entertainers by entertaining the masses, right? Delivering a magic trick to people in India, they could never do that from their their, their stage on the West Coast. Um, so yeah, they they kind of they talk about this. It, it, it's also a community of practice where I think that these things are not. You know, it's not just about the self, it's also about the self in connection with other artists. Um, in the pandemic, they formed the like social pod of hanging out at each other's houses and kind of talking each other up, like getting over the mean comments, laughing at the mean comments and talking about like, no, you're really doing great work, right? Like we're spreading magic. We're really, we're like real entertainers. Um, and so I think that, that that's also an important part of how, how socially people are making sense of this, this experience and this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I can I interrupt with do oh, some of the online questions yeah, here, yeah. and then we'll come back to uh, here. Um, let's see. If online platforms wanted to reduce the simplification of viral content, for example, reduce racial stereotypes, mm -hmm. how would they do that? So um, this would disincentivize people from making content. But there was a really interesting art uh, art project. I forgot the artist's name. The Demetricator, have you heard of that? The Demetricator. Um, it, it was for general users. It's actually a software that you can download um, so that your um, your Facebook uh, appears without any metrics on it. I think they made it for Twitter as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that you just get content, but you don't get to see the like thumbs up, mm -hmm. you know, and the reactions. And so you, you don't get this ranking. Um, so yeah, that would be one one way you could demetricate or put the demetricator on the on the creator studio. But then, and then I don't think anybody would actually right. do it, do it, right? And nobody would watch it. Um, yeah, I like th this is a fact of what metrics do. Like metrics simplify. Um, if you have any kind of number and you render quality into that number, it it clears out and it shrinks all other competing metrics or all, all other competing measures, right? It's right. just a, it's just a number. I and mean, we see it in academia, right? With like chasing your Google citation count, right? Like it doesn't matter if the paper, it doesn't matter if your work is good, just look at the number of like how many sites you got. Um so uh yeah, anyway. Um yeah, so I I would say yeah, there's some thought experiments around there, but in practice I don't I don't have an answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure, and then we'll go on. Yep. Uh, so I used to I used to work within the media, and a lot of the things that you were talking about that influence the space, I feel a lot of journalist space. Yes, uh, because it's the same business model; they're they're running the same race. Uh, and listicles is a great example of journalistic cringe. Like every journalist hates writing listicles. Listicles, but you just yeah. see them everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering if uh, these influencers had any thoughts or ideas on like a better business model that might work for them. Yeah, uh, because journalists are struggling for this as well, and I don't think we have good answers. So, yes. do these people have better answers? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's a there's a great book by Angel Christine uh, called Metrics at Work about the um, uh, comparing the U.S. and France and what happens to the newsroom when clicks start become the new the new measure as opposed as opposed to like quality or editorial content. And so you have these competing orders of worth. Um, yeah, so. There are some content creators in in my sample that are interested in um, taking their what they've cultivated on the platform and transforming it into other other out I don't know other careers in um, in television. Uh, one person wants to be a TV personality. One person wants to be a filmmaker. Still, um, yeah, a couple of them are thinking that they'll be able to pivot and and use uh, use this. Um, into these other areas that's I don't know if that will actually work for them it's also not an answer to your question about what to do about the listicles <laughs> other than no, like I feel this attention seems like a intrinsically democratic thing if mm -hmm. more people watch it it's good right I mean it's really hard to fight against that yeah yeah uh, yeah 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 right just... right 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 that is like a real Bourdieu split I think that that's a real tension of Bourdieu it's about the social worth of an audience um I mean, like, so part of my story is about how metrics are are kind of shaping people's practices. But at the center of it, like, the, it is the fact that it's a mass audience. If you want to appeal to a mass audience and catch the most attention, you have to kind of do something that is going to speak to the majority, right? I mean, 
I don't know, like the, the most snobbish way I could put it um, is the lowest common denominator, right? And like they they really, the content creators that I study really take offense to that because they say that that's devaluing the audience, but like audiences do exist in a social hierarchy of worth. And it's simply if you're going to go for mass attention, then you do have to transform standards, right? Because what counts in journalistic editorial standards, similar as what counts as like the, the rules of art, you know, those are those are things that are um, kind of known among a re relatively small field of insiders who have access to you know particular forms of knowledge that took time to study. They have cultural capital, right? The majority of the world doesn't. Um, yeah, it's just like a general rule from the art world, like the greater the size and social spread of your audience, the lower the value of your work of art. I think that newsrooms, I saw this in the fashion modeling world for sure, um, they, they strike a balance by doing a little bit of both and kind of navigating it. So you can do your listicles and that might like pay the bills so that you can also hire the journalists that will do the, you know, the editorial blue chip kind of reporting. Um, these content creators, for the most part, it's, it's an either or, um, the ones that, that I've studied. But I think that influencers, perhaps um, someone could uh, could chime in on here. I think that influencers are also balancing this, right, to make content that pays the bills that, that goes viral, but also doesn't water down their personal brand and alienate their niche following, which is what will lead to their, you know, capturing brand deals. So you see that tension kind of play out, I think, but it's always there. And so, we Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Um, I, I wanted to, it's more of a thinking point for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're aware that it exists. Um, I'm an influencer. Um, <laughs> I, it was about datafication and gamification. Yeah. And actually about how um, your, you call them ID influencers on your scale. Yeah. And uh, economic capital, how those interact. Um, I know people in the space who will get banned on purpose, who will get temporary bans to take holiday or to um, increase their viewership. Mm -hmm. That's very common actually mm -hmm. on the higher end of social platforms like Twitch and YouTube mm -hmm. um, so that they can get discourse on other websites like oh, Twitter and Reddit right. and they get pushed to audiences. So actually I just wanted to talk about like how the datification and gamification of that ban point is exactly the same for both sets of influences. It's no different between your uh -huh. you know, the people you studied and, and people who yeah. personal right like very personal content. Right. Yeah, it's just a different strategy, but like same game. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Um, um I really like the talk. I thought the you. story of how you went through everything was really, really good. Thanks. Um following up kind of on the audience stuff, when you're looking at the symbolic versus economic capital. And you talk about how there's these like standard influences. They kind of have two types of content where you would say like, here's me, you know, take someone like at the very high end, Selena Gomez being like, here's me doing something that's explicitly for my album or explicitly for a photo shoot. And you know that this is a professional photo and you know that I'm kind of playing a role mm -hmm. versus here's a selfie I took in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. And the audience most of the time feels comfortable to be able to discern between the two. Yeah. And they buy into that because they're like, oh, I like her and I like that she's doing her professional thing. Yeah. But actually all of it is professional. And even yourself <laughs> in my kitchen is just part of the image, right? Of the, part of the casualization. Yeah. And so talking about like how this is the devalued audience for like the content, you know, these content farms, because they're not related to the specific person in the video and quite a lot of the time it's just a page and they don't recognize someone, is there as much recognition of the like, how performative the content is because especially when you bring brought up the comments earlier you've yeah. got people saying like yeah. oh this shouldn't be on Facebook can't believe she did that but how is that most of the audience that are saying like oh wow I actually believe in this content yeah I think that this is a real video yeah 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 uh, how do I study this this is so interesting and I, I don't have a way to actually study it um so I'll tell you from the content creator's point of view uh they believe that some of the audience knows that it's fake and they think, and they also know that some of the audience doesn't doesn't know that it's fake. They don't want to trick anybody. They don't want to make it into the news necessarily. Although, although they think it's funny when it happens, <laughs> but like it's not their goal to make it into the New York Post. Um, and from their point of view, everybody should know that it's fake. Yeah, that they, they think that it's parallel to. Uh, the World Wrestling Federation, right? Like everybody knows that's fake, right? That's not why people watch it. They think that it's parallel to reality TV, right? Or like daytime talk shows. Everyone knows at that stage. But I think that 
they're not accounting for the fact that actually the genre of the news feed is is like pretty confusing where there's advertising there's real stuff from your friends and family there's fake stuff from your friends and family and there's fake stuff from these influencers who are trying to look like your friends and family right and so it's a it's a confusing genre and then there's a lot of context collapse there's a lot of um there's a lot of mobility across platforms where things are kind of popping up everywhere. There's really high counts on this content so that, okay, it will like if 500 million people saw it, there must be something about this, right? Like it must be really, really a bizarre thing. So I think that it's, it's confused. It's a, yeah, the, the genre is different than legacy media. Um, the, the other kinds is, of television. Do you think that's related to the fact, like, because it's newsfeed content rather than like, if you on Instagram, that's designed by people that you follow. Whereas I guess most of these pages get the majority of their views, not from users that follow the page specifically, but that it gets promoted into their newsfeed. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's that. And um, and also Facebook transformed its newsfeed quite a lot in like a relatively short amount of time. Facebook Watch launched, launched in 2018. Um, and now they're following the TikTok model algorithm of just like millions of possibilities coming into your newsfeed based on, you know, algorithmic prediction. Whereas, I, I don't know, like five years ago, it really would be things that were happening in your friends and families that was like the majority of what happened on the news i think that that's that shift is not readily apparent to everybody yeah um yeah can i can i ask a yeah. question here um a number of students here are part of the methods class and qualitative yeah. methods and i wish you'd talk a little bit about like how much time this took you to yeah. do this especially to come up with the, your six part sort of theory yeah. <laughs> yeah. and something on um the uh, entree, uh, how how you learned who these people were, how you actually contacted them initially, yeah. in order to persuade them to um, to talk to you. Sure, yeah, that's interesting stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's although my my entree is um, really not something that that could be followed easily, unfortunately. Um, yeah, the ethnographies that I do, they, they kind of land in my lap, and this was no exception. I. Um, I had this book come out in 2020 about nightlife. It came out in May 2020. You really can't imagine a worse time for a book about nightlife <laughs> to come out in the world. Um, but somehow it, uh, it it made the rounds uh, into the founder's reading list. And he's a voracious reader, like quite lucky on my part. He, he likes sociology a lot and he reads a lot of ethnographies. And he was interested in nightlife. He used to be a, a reporter and he used to report on uh, uh, nightlife and culture. So um, he read my book and emailed me and was oh, like, hey, yeah. if you ever want to do a study of influencers, I can I can show you around and, you know, um, and, uh, and and then the more I got to talking with him, just the more fascinated I became. Um, that had its own challenges, of course, uh -huh. because um, I've written about them publicly in this essay in The Economist in which I use their name. And that's the most rigorous writing that I've ever done, I, I think, as ethnographers who use masking we're allowing ourselves to get away with a lot of errors because mm -hmm. I, I I had to fact check every single detail to make absolutely sure that I was getting everything correct mm -hmm. because their real names are, are out in print on this. Um, and now when I'm doing my academic writing, I'm masking again, just for the Googleable factor. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I don't want these more critical papers to come up when people Google their name for dating or something and they like, mm -hmm. you know, have this a uh, critical Marxist analysis of them. Um <laughs> not like that would actually matter. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's not that would actually matter. Uh, but just for my own sake. So anyway, that's just that's a side note about about writing. Um I, I, it was a pandemic project. I started doing the Zoom interviews and the online ethnographic component first. And then I started flying there um, once uh, travel became more normal. Um, and um, I was able to collect a lot of data really in a short amount of time. I think like 60 interviews for me went by really quickly because I could even do two in a night sometimes with the time zone difference. I'm in Boston and they're on the West Coast. And I was able to... Um, yeah, just schedule the scheduling worked out really well because my kids go to bed um, right when they were finishing their work day, you know, with the time difference. And that that was great. And I didn't have anything else to do because it was the pandemic. <laughs> so a lot of people have weird pandemic stories. And this is mine. Like, I became a viral content creator. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, you know, the data analysis is always, always a problem. I think if you're an inductive uh, ethnographer, most ethnographers work inductively, um, you end up with reams and reams of data, but you don't know what it's a case of until like I presented it a few times. Um, I wrote several versions of papers. I wrote this article for The Economist that helped me kind of streamline what's mm -hmm. important, talked with the editor, you know, talked with my colleagues. 
And um, that's more like abductive analysis. I started reading a lot more in a field that I'm not used to reading calm and like information studies. So that, mm -hmm. that's also, you know, been kind of fun. Um, so I finished the field work, I guess it was uh, May, 2021. And I had a rough version of something like this theory, the labor process theory. I think it's too long. It'll, it'll probably go through a few more versions. Mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have suggestions on which ones to cut, like a six part labor process theory is a little bit too much. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's uh, usually after field work project like this, it'll take me about a year to, before I have something I could submit uh, for, uh, for a journal. Yeah. For a journal article, for a journal article. For a book. <laughs> oh, much longer for a book. Yeah, and that's actually a shame about working on a, a topic like this because it moves so quickly. Mm -hmm. And this is this is why I published in the Economist actually because I I just knew that I won't get an article published for at least a year and like mm -hmm. the company might be finished by then, like Facebook might be finished by then. <laughs> yeah, well, probably not, but like you know right. this this kind of uh, attention economy might be old news, and so I, I really felt the pressure to publish quickly, mm -hmm. yeah. which doesn't align with our with our field as academics. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, this question in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly on that field of longevity. And yeah. You discussed earlier the idea of algorithmic anticipation of the creators. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, is there fear that their whole careers in this is going to be over? And you also discussed the idea of like, oh, I could maybe segue into filmmaking, or like, I could do this. Like, how? How does their fear of the algorithm or love of the algorithm yeah. impact that kind of like? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So they understand this as a really short-term game that they're in. Um, the time that I was doing the research, there were four major algorithm changes um, and they're able to respond on a dime. Like they'll this completely, we were shooting three minute videos and the next week we were shooting 10 minute videos and, like, and, and live streaming, right? Um, and they're just extremely nimble. Um, and they see that it's unstable, yeah. And that's that's kind of part of how so many of them um, have reorganized their lives ar around uh, pursuit of virality. They are um, many of them quit their jobs. They moved uh, to be closer uh, to one another. Um, they uh, they'll kind of reorganize their time. So one person had a really great uh, explanation. Um, he was like, I can't do my own laundry anymore because it's $4,000, right? Like the hour it'll take him to do his own laundry. He could be making a video. So like, he has to outsource it. Like he can't afford it. It's very interesting, you know, and because they understand also that like next month that income might be gone. So they really do talk about it like a gold rush. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very, very interesting kind of narrow way to, you know, see your future just day to day. And it's really different than the influencer, you know, like the influencer really is doing a long game of like, let me, let me build up slowly and then eventually it will pay off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a question in here about similar sorts of thing. Um, is there, it, what are the long run professional aspirations of the people who make these yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is like a pandemic blip. Uh, I think a lot of them are thinking of it that way. Um, many of them, as I mentioned, they went back to performing uh, on stage, their first love, if they were performing artists. Um, some of them are also thinking that they might be able to, to uh, take these skills and do something either in the influencer or the media or, or filmmaking space. Um, few of them think that they'll be able to cultivate a following here that could launch their stardom and as like TV celebrities. Um, I think that's probably the least likely outcome <laughs> for many of them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, you know, it's interesting. I should follow up because, um, you know, for instance, somebody had a baby, like it's really hard to do. This is like an incredibly time intensive labor in which they're, they're working like 14 hour days. Um, filming, editing, uploading, testing, you know, like checking the data. Um, so yeah, it, it would be interesting to see how one combines family with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll ask what, one or two more questions. Oh yeah, sure. I, we need to end. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know um, how, to what extent platforms play a role? Because you talked a lot about Facebook and with people having a Facebook audience in mind. And um, yeah. I imagine these audiences are very distinct, mm -hmm. like TikTok or YouTube ports yeah. audiences. And yeah. can you see like a shift um, from the audience they have in mind or from the platforms they are relying on? Yeah. So Facebook is the world's biggest platform. Right? It has over 2 billion users. Um, but the connotation of Facebook is really different than the connotation of Instagram or TikTok. Yeah. TikTok being like younger, Instagram being more high status, right? Facebook 
kind of being like over, but nobody can get off of it actually, right? Like we're all stuck on it. Um, and, uh, and it's, it has a lot of bad PR because of the various scandals. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I, the people that, um, I think it fits within this field's uh, perspective, like the fact that they're on Facebook um, and the fact that they're reaching the huge Facebook audience does also mean that they have less status, right? It's like my, um, my influence, my uh, my Chanel influencer friend. When I told her I was making videos for Facebook, she was like, mm, "You should do that for Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> it's much higher status to be on Instagram than on Facebook." And people, and and actually, the content creators themselves, when they're filming videos in public, uh, like I showed you, like in Walmart, sometimes they'll get asked, "Oh, hey, what you, you know, what are you doing?" And they'll say, "I'm making a TikTok," mm -hmm. because everybody knows what that is. Like, I'm making a Facebook video. Nobody knows what that is, right? Like, but like, all the money is on Facebook. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it, it definitely has less culture cachet than the other uh content creators and i think when people think of content creators also in the literature although correct me if i'm wrong i think there's a tendency to pay attention to influencers right the the people who are gaining cultural capital but not necessarily making the economic capital yeah um so i have kind of two questions yeah. so the first one is uh first of all thank you for your talk that was great yeah um i lost my phone <laughs> uh, was there anything akin to this in like looking at the history of like media and like how how audiences engage with media has there been anything akin to this yep okay yes yes um so there is a literature in media studies um like uh, uh ang and napoli um yeah people who have studied how the measurements of audiences impacts um, the the production of culture mm -hmm. uh, in po in politics as well. So if you look at like dial testing in Hollywood, you know, like put people in a focus group in a room together and, and they turn the dial when it you know when it's lat when it's good or when it's bad. Um, but gatekeepers previously had access to that data, also in political campaigns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is like a specialized knowledge of, of measuring what kind of messages work. Um, so I think the thing that's really interesting is that like anybody now has access to that information. Yeah. I mean, and what you do with it, I think some people are better or less better or worse positioned to, uh, to, to work it. Um, people I studied are really well positioned for it, yeah. but so anyway, their perception because they have access to these data tools is that they're the ones that are in control and that it's not the platform. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a misperception, right? Like the platform is a new gatekeeper, right? right? But from their perspective, they're completely independent and they're going directly to the market without this gatekeeping intermediary. That's super it's super interesting, yeah. 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 So it's very empowering, to, you know, the question about like, where's the, the sense of power come from? And actually related to that is my second question is how do they navigate their own sense of ethical obligation? I will. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that that one's a little bit more of a mix. Um, uh, yeah, I think that they have a lot of discourses about how what they're doing is good, right? And that they're they're deliberately tuning out a lot of legitimate critiques around uh, how what they're doing um, is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, problematic because it's inauthentic. It's it's obfuscation, right? It's like hiding the fact that it's inauthentic. Um, it's extremely commercial, right? It's like simplifies people, uh, simplifies stories, reproduces the sexist, sexist and racialized imagery. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of problems with it for sure, uh, but they emphasize at least in their community of practice the positives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all Great. so much. Yeah, so thank let's you. give Ashley one more round. Of <laughs>